So up next is an overview of programmable privacy by Ying Tong at Geometry. Okay, thank you, Kobe. Thank you, Chloe. Um, so now we're going to come back to the year 2023, and we're going to take an overview um, at the programmable privacy landscape um, in blockchains. So basically, we're going to look at programmable privacy constructions, both at the application and protocol levels. And we're going to treat the cryptographic primitives as black boxes. And the point of this talk is a high-level overview that should motivate um, the rest of the talks today um, that will open some of these black boxes. And this is also part of an ongoing work with uh, Daniel and Brian from Inverse Tech and supported by the Zcash Foundation. So recently, programmable privacy has become kind of a trending phrase because the Flashbots people have been saying it. And in the Flashbots context, what they mean is the ability for a user to conditionally reveal their transaction to a searcher. So for example, um, I have some transaction that I know you're going to back run and you're going to profit from. So I'm going to reveal it to you conditional on you sharing some of that profit with me. And so programmable here refers to the ability to encumber your transaction or your data on arbitrary predicates of your choice. So this definition of programmable privacy is pretty different from most other privacy-centric projects, um, such as Zcash, such as the Secret Network. So I, I, I come from the Zcash side of things, and when I think of programmable privacy, I think of basically never revealing your data, um, but still being able to compute arbitrary functions on it or to verify arbitrary features about it. Um, and so in the Flashbots case, they are really motivated by needing instantaneous privacy, short-term privacy. And the point there is that you do want to reveal uh, your transaction at some point because you want to execute the trade. Whereas um, in the Zcash case, like if I pay for an abortion using Zcash, that I don't ever want anyone to find out. Um, so it's very different motivations. And yeah, the, the sort of treatment of privacy is very different in these two cases. So for example, Zcash was based on the zero cash paper and that had definitions for indistinguishability, unlinkability, other privacy features, which um, the Flashbot people don't have right now, and I think it would be interesting to try and apply it um, to, to what they call programmable privacy. But yeah, um, if you squint a little bit, maybe these two definitions can start to look the same. Like for example, if you gate the Flashbot's transaction on um, ownership, so only the owner of the transaction can ever decrypt it, then you pretty much recover the second case. But that's not really the spirit of it. Um, like I said, in Flashbots, they do want to decrypt um, pretty soon, before this block ends. Um, cool. So yeah, the, the sort of paradigm of the Flashbots case is usually multi-party and off-chain. It's a user and a searcher is two parties, both of secret state, jointly computing some program. And this is usually pretty expensive um, and involves a very online process. So that has to happen off-chain. Whereas the second case we are probably more familiar with here, uh, you can just, just use zero knowledge proofs for that. Usually a single party holds all the state and um, they can ver they can uh, the state can be verified um, asynchronously, which means it can be done on-chain. So with this in mind, um, yeah, this pretty much motivated the SOK on programmable privacy. Um, and with this in mind, we went on to look at a few um, applications and protocols and some 
common constructions and patterns across them. And, and so we came up with a few observations. The first one is that a programmable privacy largely is an application level design choice. So for example, um, Tornado Cache is a fully private application on Ethereum, which is not a private protocol. Um, but the point of being on a private protocol is that you can actually um, enhance uh, the application's privacy by firstly, composing anonymity sets across applications. So if you run Tornado Cache on Zcash, then your notes are gonna look like everyone else's notes and your anonymity set will be larger. It's a network effect. And that's why you would wanna run it on Zcash. Um, secondly, providing economic security guarantees. So for example, making use of the validator set of the protocol for threshold encryption. And these validators are staked and can be slashed if they misbehave. Um, and if you run your, just your own application, you would not have this as, as large of an uh, economic gar security guarantee. And lastly, um, a protocol can also encourage privacy-preserving design patterns. And we're going to give an example of this with the MENA protocol. Um, but this, this last point is a bit like restrictive. So by, by this allowing you from doing some things under protocol, they actually um, strongly encourage you to design your applications privately. So yeah, um, we came up with three large categories um, that, that guided our, our thinking uh, for these protocols. So is a combination of um, single party and multi party on chain and off chain transaction creation. So we're going to go through these one by one. I, I'm actually just going to go through these one by one. So the first case we're probably the most familiar with is single party and off chain transaction creation. So, for example, Zcash, um, a single party um, knows the whole um, plain text of the note that they're trying to spend. And they're interacting off-chain um, with a known uh, application logic. So either the sapling um, um, span transfer or the new, newer orchard action. And so they don't need anyone's help uh, to compute a proof of a correct state transition. And on-chain, um, so, so the fully formed transaction is then submitted on-chain. And what the nodes on-chain have to do is simply validate the proof and also update the public state, which is the note commitments and nullifiers. So this pattern um, is very powerful. And it, this design is used again and again in many protocols because it, it gives us um, some very powerful primitives. So, with the, with the note commitment tree, we get um, an anonymity set. And the set membership proof is what gives us the legitimacy to participate in this protocol. Um, the unique nullifier enforces a linear resource logic. In other words, it prevents double spends. And it's what allows the protocol to maintain desired invariance. Um, and lastly, the validity predicates, which in in the case of Zcash, it's a span of transfer um, and forces resource consumption rules. And the limitation, as we said before, is that the, these predicates in this paradigm must be satisfiable by a single party. So um, ALIO is a generalization of Zcash. So under the hood, ALIO's data structures and um, um, state models, execution models look pretty much like Zcash. The, the one thing they changed is that they allow arbitrary um, validity predicates and you're, not, you're no longer limited to sapling or orchard. But besides that, pretty much the same single player off-chain transaction creation. Um, now, something that Alio actually opens the user up to is this, this danger, this foot gun, uh, you, you can design actually like a trivially de-anonymizing app in Alio. So for example, I write a contract that says like, the only method in this contract is Intong transfers five ether to Kobe. 
So it is true that every time I call it, um, <laughs> to, to an observer, it looks like spending one, uh, like a transaction that's creating a new note commitment and a new nullifier, and it cannot be linked to a note commitment. That is true, but <laughs> that the, the contract literally has only one method, so it's very clear who's doing what. Um, but um, this actually can be mitigated with functional privacy, so like one extra layer of obfuscation so that um, no one can tell which function I, I called. And that's that was part of the original Zaxi design, but I think Alio Testnet 3 got rid of that. Um, and so, yeah, with, these, with, with this primitive, you can build a bunch of very cool apps, like I got this from the Alio Docs website. And yeah, this is probably the paradigm we understand the most, and we know um, all these useful apps that that we can make just with single party off-chain transaction creation, just using zero knowledge proofs. Um, so yeah, you probably see a bunch of these apps um, over the course of the day. The point that I'm making is that they're all the same shape of apps. So the next category that we came up with is, um, multi-party on-chain transaction creation. So again, as fast as if I give you an example. So the Penumbra protocol um, basically has each user individually um, encrypt um, a swap, um, and encrypt a swap. And what a swap consists of on their site is spending some token. Um, and then on-chain, the validator um, on chain the the validators homomorphically add these encrypted spends and get an aggregated batch swap. So this batch swap is then the swap that is executed against what is effectively a global liquidity pool. Um, and the results um, and the results of that swap uh, can be claimed by users who prove that they were part of the original batch. So what this relies on is two things. Firstly, it relies on threshold encryption. So the users have to be able to meaningfully encrypt their private state to some uh, economic core, uh, economically trusted quorum of actors, which are the validators. And secondly, um, homomorphic yeah, homomorphic encryption. So the validators have to be, be able to add up all these swaps. And so this, this penumbra kind of flow, oh, I have diagrams. Yeah, um, right, that's what I said. This penumbra kind of flow pretty much works for any commutative operations. So for example, like adding stuff up, yeah, pretty, actually that's, that's all they do, they add stuff up. So you can add up swaps, you can add up votes. Um, you can also, yeah, that's the two things that you can do. Um, so I think what's interesting to note here, what, what differentiates this from the first case is that the transaction creation happens on chain. So each user cannot uh, the, each user cannot individually execute a trade. They need to rely on validators to batch their, their swaps for them. Um, and yeah, this is, this is the, the big difference um, between the first and second categories. Um, and having transaction creation take place on chain um, makes use of the, once again, the economic security guarantees um, of your validators. So another example, you, you could argue, um, is the MENA protocol. And a disclaimer here, I'm referring to the ZK apps part of the MENA protocol, which is not um, on mainnet, I think. But, but ZK apps, you can interact with them already on testnet. So MENA is, also allows you um, to specify any arbitrary validity predicate in your ZK app. Um, and just like Alia, you can design a trivial, 
trivially de-anonymizing app. It's a little bit worse than Alio because, um, privacy-wise, because um, it has an account-based model where um, state updates are done in place, whereas Alio has an append-only UTXO um, set. So I can always tell uh, which contract you're updating in Mina. Um, so why I put it in this category is because you could you could replicate Penumbra um, on Mina because um, Mina natively supports this action reducer flow um, that allows you to publish some public actions um, that are commutative and that can can be reduced by some authorized um, party specified by your ZK app. So in other words, you could publish all the ciphertexts um, from Penumbra on, onto the MENA ZK app and have someone um, batch and reduce them. So then the difference with Penumbra is that the authority that you're encrypting to is not directly the chain's validator set. It's your own validator set or your own admin. Um, and another quality of MENA that um, is sort of a protocol level quality is a very, very limited um, execution environment. So um, the MENA validators, they are, they're only going to do two things. They are only going to do this um, action reducer flow and they're going to verify proofs and you can do nothing else. And they, they allot a very limited storage space per app. So effectively, this forces application designers to keep most of their data off-chain anyway. Um, so yeah, but, but that being said, you could still design a trivially de-anonymizing app once again. It's just making it a bit harder for you. I have two minutes left. That's not enough minutes. <laughs> um, so another example, this just came out a few days ago, is Suave Chain. Um, and I recommend everyone go and watch Andrew Miller's talk on TEE, TEEs in the Suave Chain. Um, so in this proposed design, that that they actually have an off-chain network of TEEs. Um, to, to whom you submit your, uh, your private bits and preferences. And these TEEs contain um, solvers and strategies uh, that will produce complete transactions for you. Um, so this happens off-chain, but the reason why I put this in the on-chain category is because um, all the bits and preferences are committed to on-chain and this forces their inclusion off-chain. So the computation is not done on-chain, but it's, it's kind of forced into the off-chain system. So this is another example of using the on-chain economic guarantees um, for privacy. So and <laughs> um, another, the two similar examples are Zama F FHEVM and the secret network. So these are fully on-chain. Um, Zama, you threshold and you, you threshold encrypt to their validators on chain. Secret network, you encrypt to their um, network of TEE nodes on chain. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna speed through the last category. This is an extension of the first category, and basically, it's the same off-chain transaction creation paradigm, but expanded to support multi-party um, private states. So Anoma basically um, has its solvers off-chain um, trying to match um, intents and preferences from multiple parties and produce balanced transactions that are then submitted on-chain. And this is a very generic architecture um, that can work with a bunch of the other solutions we saw earlier. Um, so one sort of multi-party um, um, pr program you could run is this back running, MPC back running program that Flashbots did. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Um, so I think 
some questions that I want to leave you with is, so since um, programmable privacy is so largely dependent on application design choices, what are some best practices and uh, some, some good patterns for privacy preserving applications? And how does privacy affect actually the mechanisms of your applications? And secondly, um, what can protocols do at the minimum uh, to support these privacy preserving applications? Yeah, thank you, that's all I have.